all alive because uh, last time I had some audio issues uh, when we were announcing the stream. But let's see. Okay, good. People are starting to turn up in the chat already. Uh, the obligatory sort of will just wait for about 30 seconds or so because I think some people get adverts and uh, we'll move along. Well, it's been a busy week, hasn't it? Since, uh, in fact, we didn't have a code zone last week and I'll just I'll just wait a little bit to see, see who gets here going. We, we can see in the chat already we've got uh, Bixie is here complaining about uh, Raylib breaking. Annie Cater's here. That's good, good, good. At least we've got two people. Uh, and we've got uh, Veldin. Uh, Magetsub, hello. Uh, good to see you. Well, Magetsub, you're not first. That makes a change. What's it? You're letting the side down. Uh, anyway, right. Yes, it has been a busy couple of weeks. Uh, and I thought we'd do a bit of a catch-up episode on sort of all the things that I've been coding uh, since the last time we spoke. Now, firstly, apologies, there wasn't a code zone last Tuesday. Those in the know will know that it was a friend of mine's funeral. Uh, that's all done now, we're sorted. Uh, I got back a bit late and I wasn't really in the mood for doing uh, some code zone. And also I know that the jam was starting and I wanted to get some materials ready for the jam. So who was first today was uh, Bixie. Bixie was first today. Didn't say first though, so it's invalid. No internet points for Bixie. Uh, right, so I have been working on uh, three different things since the last episode of Code Zone. Uh, and so I thought I'll, I'll go through them all. Um, why not? Because I think there's some interesting points on all of them. Uh, I made you a theme tune, the lack of first invalidates your game. That's a good point, actually. Uh, I'm going to try playing the theme tune as now has become customary, uh, but. Don't hold your breath if the audio can't be heard. <laughs> Let's have a go. <laughs> Wasn't very successful last time, right? So this is the latest iteration of it. Are you ready? Here we go. Maybe you heard that, maybe you didn't. I don't know. Uh, so, who have we got? Oh, uh, we get some, yes, for the next code of that's that's preemptive. Uh, Sunsetty, greetings to you. Uh, Channel Mouse, evening. <laughs> Came through loud and clear. Good. <laughs> Hopefully, I've fixed a little audio gram. I don't think it was an audio gram, I think it was Chrome being a little bit overprotective over some YouTube assets. Because um, I did play around later and I, I just couldn't get uh, OBS to record. Uh, audio that was playing on certain tabs in Chrome. So uh, there we go. Yes, uh, yes, Jelly. That was the uh, the latest theme soon, um, latest version of it. I think we're we're kind of there actually. So now I just need to work on the animation. But been busy anyway. We're already like three minutes into Code Zone and we've not even started talking about anything yet. Um, oh, big thanks to all of the new subscribers, by the way. Uh, 25 here on Twitch. Mostly that was a gift from Voxel to quite a lot of people during the theme announcement. If you weren't aware, the jam is currently ongoing. Uh, it's very exciting. There's lots of interesting progress being shown on the Discord server. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the subscribers on here. And thank you for the subscribers on YouTube. We hit a little milestone. Uh, it's not one that I'm going to jump around celebrating because it's kind of just a, a natural evolution of the trajectory of the curve kind of milestone rather than because of any particular effort I've put in. Um, but we hit 300,000 subscribers uh, on YouTube. So that's a, it's a bit of an ego boost, isn't it? Yeah, I think uh, this, you know, when it was 100,000, it's because I, I was seeing it like go up a thousand a month. And I was like, because I was putting loads of effort into videos. And then for 200,000, I'd just spent six months building a NES emulator. And so there was like, you know, it was a good payoff for the reward. Uh, the 300,000, it, it's, it's nice that the channel's still ticking along. But let's be honest, I've not put out uh, really very much content at all this year. Um, so, you know, that's, it's just... It's just sort of a bubbling along level, and it doesn't mean quite as much. But of course, I, I appreciate I appreciate that people are still hanging around. Uh, finally, catching your stream. Thank you for the knowledge you share. Well, some call it knowledge, some call it dangerous factoids. Um, right. Let's 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 look at some code. There was code on my screen. Now, I just want to cover a little bit that I did on the editor project, so it's not just being a complete loss. Uh, where where we left? Where we last left the editor project, um, we were looking at how we handled these static tile sources. And then I thought, right, it's time to get to the exciting bit. I want to start drawing things. And 
I didn't quite get that far. But we can look at some interesting code, uh, because there's an interesting design decision uh, that's been made here. And it's one that maybe not everybody watching this or watching this on the JavaJX9 Extra channel will be familiar that you can do this sort of thing. Uh, and uh, I, I, there'll, there'll be some seasoned C++ pros grumbling at me and all sorts when, when they start to see this. So amazing to see you stream. Oh yeah, I, the, the Lemma random number stuff, uh, I did actually put a link in the code to the source. At the time when I made that video, I couldn't for the life of me find the source uh, of where I'd, I'd pick that up. I just sort of copied and pasted this bit of code for the previous like, almost 20 years. Uh, um, but there is a link now in the source code, it's been there for a few years now, uh, where, where the actual, the guy who calculated that number has come from. Uh, right, ah, Londo is here as well, good evening. <laughs> I the word content. <laughs> yeah, I don't like the word content either. Seems a bit generic, doesn't it? We know that for the editor, we're going to have uh, lots of layers. Things could be tile layers, geometry layers, all sorts of things like that. We, we, we know that we're going to build it up like in Photoshop. So you, you might want layers, in our case, of things like booleans, numbers, digits, shapes, whatever. It doesn't matter. We just know that there's going to be layers. And so in our editor, we're grouping all of those things in this object called a layered construct. Now, of course, a layered construct is a work object like everything else in our editor. Uh, but right now, all the layered construct has is a standard vector of standard shared pointers to an OLC edit 2 DWO layers base layer, <laughs> um, vec layers. Basically, it's a vector of something um, that's deriving from base layers, vector of pointers to these base layers. Now, this base layer, let's have a quick look at what this is. Um, I have to remember where I've put it. Uh, is it this one? Uh, no, it's not that one. Uh, base layer, base layer, base layer. Sounds kind of sounds like base player, doesn't it? Let's go to where, where actually is it? No. Uh, now, the base layer itself is also a work object. Because uh, I want to inherit all of these sort of serialization things that we created last time. So it's, it's quite useful. Uh, but it's not a work object in the same uh, respect as everything else. This base layers and layers will only exist within this layered construct. They're not going to be some isolated source elsewhere in the environment. Uh, let's have a look. I have permission to have you on the big telly. Oh, <laughs> so what I should do is go right up to the camera and go, ah, you can see right down my throat like that. Uh, Alter is here. Uh, Coding Butter is saying, uh, praying that the game comes together. Yes, of course, there is an ongoing jam at the moment, so people are quite busy doing, uh, making things. Spent too much time fighting with him, Scripton. <laughs> I've got all that fun to come yet. We'll, we'll get round to my jam entry in a bit. Um, long COVID is long. Oh dear, that's a sad thing to see. Yeah, it's surprising uh, that, that people think COVID's sort of all gone away now. And uh, I've actually had a, a recent family death due to COVID. Uh, so it, it is still kicking around. It surprised us all when they said it was COVID. <laughs> Rapid prototyping, that's a good way to think about it. Looking forward to splash screen adventure this year. <laughs> it's, it's okay, guys. Um, it was one of those things. I mean, the, the, the guy wasn't that well to begin with, but it, it was actually they declared as COVID that ultimately did the job. Uh, so, there you are. Anyway, laid construct um, doesn't do anything at the moment. Uh, it's just a container of these base tiles, layers. So, let's have a look at what is a tiled layer. And this is where it gets fun, fun and interesting. So, I've created a template class called tiled layer. And that's because I know that basically, everything that's going to be represented in tile space is going to have the same set of functions and accesses. That's exactly what templates are for. If my tiled layer contains booleans, it's bool. We'll get back to that one in a minute. If it contains integers, it's an integer. If it contains graphics, it's a graphic. If it contains hexagons, it's a hexagon. What, it doesn't matter. It just assumes um, it's a tiled layer. And uh, so I've created some basic functions that allow me to set a tile and get a tile from a vector 2D, in this case, um, of tiles. But then there's some interesting stuff. Um, I want my tiled layers to be able to draw themselves. The, the idea being is I want to write some code sort of once and, and, and reuse it as much as possible, but I need to customize it specifically for different types. And like C++ allows you to do this quite nicely with um, explicit template implementations. And I'll show you how tidy this solution gets in a minute. 
I've also got this rather ominous bodiless draw tile function here. And that's because the, the tiles the goods need to draw themselves. So for Boolean, I might want it to be uh, blue for true and yellow for false, taking into account people that can't see red and greens, perhaps. Um, for numbers, you might want it to display the value of the number or a shade along a particular palette or something. There's all sorts of different ways uh, we might want the tiles to represent themselves. Uh, planning to implement wave function collapse on this project. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> Why are you doing this project? Why? Which one? Well, okay, there's quite a few projects going on. Um, yeah, this is just for fun. It's just for fun. Um, just for fun. And I, I want a general Swiss Army knife of, of, of 2D editing tools um, written in a way that will output data. Once this gets a bit more mature, I think people will start to believe in actually why it's a bit different from things that are similar. Uh, doesn't the time have to know about other tiles to know where to shade, etc.? The time? The time. Doesn't the time have to know about the other tiles? Don't don't quite know that. I think there's a... Ah, tile. Does the tile have to know about other tiles to know where to shade? Uh, no, not in this case. So a, a tile is a completely exclusive thing. It, it, it has no knowledge of its surroundings. If we did, and we'll, ironically, we'll see some of this later in, in this, uh, this episode, um, if we did want the tile to have an awareness, that's the layer up. But the, at the moment, just right now, um, the tiles themselves are completely exclusive. And, and I want it to remain that way because it keeps it simple. So I have this, this sort of bodiless draw tile. Now this is something you can do uh, in C++. So I've created this template class I've inherited from base layer. So it's kind of OOP as we know it, but it's no longer really defined anywhere. But what I can go ahead and do is create a specialization. Uh, so let's say I had um, <coughs> a tiled layer that specifically handles uint 8t types, unsigned 8-bit integer types. Um, I've called this a Boolean layer because I stupidly did actually put bool in here, uh, thinking, oh, this is this is brilliant. This is going to work really well. And if I forgot. Now, hopefully, chat can get ahead of this um, <laughs> before before I get there. But let's just see what it works. All I've needed to do to provide all of the implementation I need for this particular tile is the constructor, because I might need something interesting to set that up, and this uh, uh, the draw tile function itself. And you can see that you can use this sort of uh, template specializer keyword here uh, with sort of nothing in the in the angle brackets and that allows you to just it provide a specific type implementation for that class when and where it's needed how do you auto tile let's see we're going to we're going to look at all these things later on no, don't, don't worry there's there's a there's an irony uh, in the fact that i've spent the last sort of month and a bit creating uh, quite a sophisticated framework to handle a 2d editor yet for the code jam i've needed to code one since friday and it's doing things like auto tiling and all this this fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it would have been nice to have done all the level editing stuff in this editor, but it's just not mature enough yet for that. Um, so uh, the problem I had, why, why, why when this became Boolean layer here, why is it not actually a bool? And that's because if we go back to the tiled layer implementation, we can see that the tiled layer actually is a standard vector of the type. And standard vectors of bools are disgusting, horrible nightmares uh, because they have a very special implementation in the vector class themselves. Some, I have no idea why it's this way. Some genius at the standard ISO committee thought this was a good idea, uh, but actually, and it caught me out. I, I put in bool and I ended up with all sorts of crazy linker errors. I was tearing my hair out. What's going on with this project? The templates weren't making any sense. It just, it just doesn't work. Uh, so uh, my Boolean layer is now an 8-bit byte layer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They they sort of de devolved to bit fields. So we're, what we're, what this all means is, uh, if I go now to, um, I need to think where where is this? Where is it in the workspace? Where do I actually create a uh, tiled layer? I don't think it was. I think I did it in uh, my. It could have been workspace actually. Where do I actually create a new tiled layer? Uh, 
Not be any of those. Static task source, maybe. Did I create one in there? No, it won't be in there. It just layer. Can't remember. I can't remember where I've create actually create one of these things. You say it's been a bit about two weeks since I've looked at this project. Let's have a look. I thought it was going to be in workspace. But it's not because I am creating one. Because if I make sure if I run the project, I'm just going to compile this now for half an hour. We need to play the theme tune during the compile, don't we? As long as you know what you're doing with it. I am an idiot and therefore if something can be fluffed up, I shall fluff it up. Yeah, it's a yeah, vector of vector of bools is one of those things it shouldn't catch you out. It should be it should be completely transparent. You should be able to do it and it and it works, but it just doesn't. Um, it didn't work in this context at all. Uh, I'd like to know where am I creating? My uh Ah, there we go. I was lucky. So yeah, so my just to debug this, uh, in my layered construct, uh, just by default, I have it create a vector of layers, uh, and there we go. It's creating a shared pointer to the vector of layers tiled layer uint eight t. So we've just seen that we've got a specialization for that implemented elsewhere somewhere in the project, and it's just that file. It's just this one, just these two functions. We don't even need to create the class or anything. It's just these two functions. How does this type draw itself and how does it construct itself? Let's wait for this compilation to finish. This is taking its time. I think, do you know, I don't think my programs are getting any more complicated, but I do think since 17.6, is it, of Visual Studio, that the compiler is a little bit slower. Also, I don't know why it's compiling absolutely everything. What's it doing this for? Maybe it's because I've not compiled it for a couple of weeks and it's just, it's just afraid that things have gone out of date. Yeah, it shouldn't take this long. It says uh, two, well, what was it? 3,000 functions out of four and a bit thousand were compiled. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably because it was quite a few template stuff. Anyway, where, where's this going? Um, so just to finish off the editor stuff that I actually got around to doing, um, there we go, layered constructs. We've got a, one layered construct in here, and it has a Boolean layer, and currently I've got no way of actually drawing that. So the the end, the end, moral of the story is here um, that I've done all of this quite complicated object-oriented template stuff in the background, uh, but then um, decided to move on to a slightly different project in preparation for the jam. Uh, but it works, it's selectable, it's addable to the project, it's serializable, all the stuff is there, um, but I have got no way of drawing it. Other than it is Boolean layer. And where's it getting that name Boolean layer from? Well, it's not very exciting. Uh, it gets it from this, uh, this custom type here, Boolean layer. And that's why we needed to implement a uh, specialist override for the constructor. In this instance. So there we go, a bit boring stuff, but um, yeah, pre-stream checklist to do a compile. <laughs> right, so then I thought, okay, it's it's jam time. I know what the theme is going to be. Maybe I should get a bit of a head start. And I then got some very bad news about uh, our friend and moderator, Saladin, and I just didn't feel like doing sort of jam things until somebody posted on the Discord server about making things look a bit retro. And so this was the next project that I started working on. Uh, this is a very quick one. And... Uh, Something puzzled me. The, the image that was shown was your stereotypical image of an, like a, 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 a 2D retro pixelized game with scan lines added to it and you know, the, with the title, this is a retro filter. And no doubt that you know, the, the, the chap who posted it was very proud of, of what he'd created. But it struck me that perhaps because I'm from a PAL region of the world, I've never seen scan lines on any of these things, and I've owned CRT screens. In fact, I've got two up here, uh, which I which I game on with my my older consoles. You just don't see the scan lines, so I've always been puzzled. Why is is, is it is it a movie aesthetic? Is it something to make it look old and fuzzy that we add these scan lines uh, as some sort of afterthought? Uh, Panda Tank, hello. Uh, typically, it's this time uh, every week, so eight thirty on a Tuesday. That's uh, that's UK time. 
And you see, I don't see them on my CRT monitor either. And so I, I thought, right, if I wanted to hack together a filter to make something look a bit retro, what would I do? And it certainly isn't adding scan lines to it. Now, the guy that did this wasn't wrong, and it could be that, you know, one, he sits too close to his screen, and two, maybe it's from an NTSC region or something even worse, perhaps, uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, so I'm going to, to run this. So this was, I just I just hacked this together. So this was the, the scene that was sent to me uh, to uh, to sort of make, make it look a bit retro. Um, and, and if I press the space bar, uh, I can sort of enable my filter. And I think that was a more accurate representation for me of sort of my, my childhood, as it were. It's not just a blur, and I'll explain what's going on uh, in a minute. And I, I did post all the code for this on the Discord. Uh, it's a shame, I, I just want to show sort of the, the, the color shifting as well. It's a bit tricky. You can maybe just see it in the bottom here behind the chat window. Uh, there is like a color bleed um, effect being applied. We see, wait, were scan lines exclusive to NTSC? Well, NTSC was lower resolution than PAL, which is what we had. Now, certainly the technologies were similar. That's how the, 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 the televisions worked. Um, but I think I think it's just you just you just didn't really ever see them. Um, unless unless you had your face right up to the screen. In which case then you'd you'd see sort of the individual phosphors. Uh, but you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't see the lines. So that was the, always the, the, the trade-off, wasn't it? it for, in PAL territories like where I'm from, you got more graphics on the screen, but typically they ran at 50 hertz and not 60 hertz, although we never knew the difference. Um, but the, the games, they run ever so slightly different speeds as well if they're not programmed to compensate for that. And famously, there's some NES games you can listen to, and the, the, if you listen to the American versions, the music doesn't sound quite right to us uh, PAL version players. Because uh, it's all it's all all changed key slightly. If you recorded the screen on a video camera or took a picture back then, uh, if you recorded the screen on a video camera, you you typically you just saw it flicker um, because there would be sort of desynchronization between the capture of the camera and and on the screen. Um, if you took a photograph of it, the same sort of thing. You saw you saw like a um, half the screen being been drawn. Uh, because they draw pretty quickly, these things, so the exposure time of the camera would have captured that gun traversing across the, the, the screen. Remember, exposure time on cameras is in milliseconds, right? So that's, that's a fair chunk of screen that can be drawn. Yeah, that's right, Veldin. That's uh, that's those numbers seem familiar. I don't I don't think it's quite a hundred more. I think the the pal is, it gets a bit wavy because you've got a li you've got like half lines and things at the top and the bottom, and you've also got interlaced formats as well. So anyway, yes. So this was sort of my I think I've overcooked it a little bit here as a part of a demonstration. But that's one of the things I would remember is certainly there was there was very little vertical definition. Um, but secondly, it was very important that the colours ever so slightly bled into each other. Um, and that's because the, the three sort of uh, electron beam guns um, weren't perfectly in sync. And so that's what I decided to try and emulate. I uh, just sort of throwing some ideas out there. Very simple little algorithm. In fact, that's it. That's the whole algorithm. <coughs> Where we, we take the original source image, loaded it in. Uh, and then I, th I thought, well, what I would need is, is three parameters. Uh, firstly, is is some sort of phasing. How how out of alignment horizontally are the guns? I didn't take into account vertical alignment. I assumed that they, they that was accurate. Um, and then also, there's there's a, a rise time and a fall time in the intensity. You can't just discreetly change from one illumination to the next. Uh, so I decided, well, let's emulate that too. Uh, and you want sort of uh, how I call this skew in this case. Uh, how much skew? Uh, affects the the sort of the, the rise time of that particular channel, and and the way it works is first scan line. The scan lines are all independent in this case, so there's, there's no vertical interaction at all. Um, I grab the source pixel from the image, taking into account the uh, the gun alignment. So this uh, just 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 nudges things ever so slightly a pixel backwards and a pixel forwards if necessary. Um, uh, once I've once I've got that sample source. I then leakily integrate 
towards it, which is a, a little classic thing that I use all the time in a lot of, a lot of my code, uh, where you look at a target value and you take the difference between your current value and the target value, you take a small proportion of that and you add it on to your current value. And this allows you to sort of uh, not interpolate, but smoothly move towards that target value from, from, a, from a given known value, rather than being a discrete step. And, and that, that's governed by its speed of which is governed by these skew values. And that's what gives this, this little blurring um, across the screen. So let's say I really amp up uh, the red skew. Let's give that, uh, so this is really quick. We make all, in fact, let's make all of these very quick. Let's see what difference that makes. All right, so yeah, so this is, this is far too quick. In fact, it's actually saturating saturates the pixel types the, the pixel types are, are, are smashing out at sort of full white and full black and giving us these these sort of more visual artifacts let's uh, let's dial that back a bit it's a bit silly to have sort of skews uh, more than one in this case uh, and let's put in uh, some significant sort of electron gun shifting this time so two pixels at least so let's say you dropped your telly down the stairs whilst moving it into your mate's house and it was never quite the same again since. Uh, it may end up looking a bit like this. But it was quite a useful effect to know and that's how the, the graphic artists use this. It, they use this to true effect in the background. I mean, that's why I was sent this sonic scene because it's meant to be that if it's rendered properly, the waterfall in the background just goes this transparent blue colour. Uh, rather than looking like a bunch of lines, because it was relying on the fact that the guns had a latency between uh, illuminating the pixels. Yeah, Magetsu the, then went on, as you just said there in the chat, he went on to sort of desaturate the result a bit. That's probably a wise, a wise decision. I didn't go that far. Um, but, so, that was a nice evening and, and prompted lots of discussion. Uh, and then I decided, well, it's time to start work on the jam. And in fact, and Scout's Honor this time, I really didn't start work on the jam until the theme had been announced, because I was originally going to go with something based with hexagons, uh, and I just didn't. Uh, I started working with hexagons. Uh, maybe I've got some code, actually. Where's my... Uh... Oh, oh, no, I, I, I've not got the code anymore, um, sadly. started working with hexagons and just thought, you know what, I... I, I just, I've just not got the mental, mental powers for this today. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing about it was simple. You know, you know me by now. I was trying to work things out from first principles, and everybody was sending me links to, oh, just use this article, just use this article. No, no it's uh, it's fine, um, but I was trying to to figure it all out. And the actual the basics of the hexagon stuff is 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 pretty trivial. Um, but I would, then I looked at the the links that were sent to me, and I thought this just doesn't feel right. Something about this smells off. It's far too complicated. Uh, in its current form. Why is that? And I think it's just not, nobody's come up with the right solution for it yet. Uh, the closest I saw to what I thought was my sort of interpretation was something called HECS, hexadecimal something or other system, um, which is actually a Wikipedia article about it, uh, which is like a, a super efficient way of uh, implementing sort of hexagon algorithms. I'll just see if I can uh, pull up pull up the Wikipedia page for that actually. Um, so there's some more addressing systems. Accessional grid addressing. Uh, well, I can't find it now. Hexadecimal tile addressing. Yeah, everything that's coming up is the uh, Red Blob Games article, which is which is actually it's a really interesting article. Loads of fun demos on there, but it's not the the one I was after. Um, there we go. That's the one I'm after. Let's pull that up. So this was the one. Um, that I actually saw and thought, you know what, I quite like this. There's, there's something about this that's interesting to me. It, it spoke to me a little bit. Um, hexagonal uh, efficient coordinate system, it was called. 
Uh, and it, it actually works by having two completely separated arrays. But the, the, the article goes on to list some quite, quite actually really trivial mathematics about how to then work within that hexagonal space. And, and what, what struck me and, and where things started to go wrong uh, was I was looking at this conversion to Cartesian function, which is really nice. So the, each hex is represented as an A, an R, and a C value. Uh, and it was the transformation required to go from ARC to XY. And, you know, I was tired, and so forgive me for this. And I thought, oh, that's really good. So we can go from this sort of three-dimensional coordinate, we can crush it down into these two-dimensionals. And uh, so it'd be really trivial, right? We must be able to find some sort of inverse or pseudo-inverse of this matrix and, and, and just reverse engineer that. And, of course, it, it just never dawned on me that going from three dimensions to two dimensions means we're chucking out some information. <laughs> so... Um, I did actually try manipulating and massaging this matrix to, to go the other way. I did find some sort of inverse that works. Obviously, it's not square, so you need to pad it with some interesting numbers. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just decided that it doesn't work. And why do you need that? Um, because this gives you your sort of uh, screen coordinate to hex grid coordinate there and back. Um, and it's it's not needed. So this was quite an interesting article. I'll, I'll post a link uh, because this is uh, the kind of sort of system used in... Um, sort of digital sampling systems. There we go. Yeah, so that's what I was looking at was sort of a hexagon. I, my, my plan was to build something like a... Um, you've, you've got a, a set of, of, of pieces of a, of a kingdom and you've got to try and assemble it in such a way. The theme of the jam was memory, uh, uh, that you were sort of given some tips and some hints as to how to reconstruct the kingdom. And I wanted to use it as a vehicle to explore playing with hexes, I explored playing with hexes and I didn't like it. So um, I quickly thought, you know what? Uh, I've, the, the, the maths is getting too heavy for late night coding. But also, and the, the real final nail in the coffin, was I'd have to draw all of my hexagonal artwork. <laughs> it's not something I've got a ready supply of. Um, and then when you think people want hex, top-down hex stuff looks a bit rubbish. So you kind of want to do it a bit pseudo 3 d -y. Um, uh, So it suddenly becomes complicated, then how do you actually generate the artwork? So I, I thought, you know what, let's go to the things that I know, because uh, I've only got a week on this jam uh, to program things. Let me just catch up with the chats a little bit. Yeah, so you go. It, it's uh, it, it just ended up. Being, I mean, the actual these, these sort of implementations are really trivial, um, and and that's that's what sort of struck me about it. I, I really quite liked it, um, but it's a shame that it, it doesn't work both ways, sort of readily available. So you you have to sort of jump. And you know, it's interesting. The the red blobs article, red blob games article, uh, kind of has the same problem. It just doesn't say it. It says it very subtly, and I'll, I'll let those that have all of about ten different people posted me this link, but all ten people didn't realise actually maybe it's got the same problem um, as this, and and that's what sits about so the whole thing. The whole thing smells. It just doesn't quite sit right with me that there isn't sort of a nice elegant way there to do this, and I, I think there might be, and I think the answer actually lies in thinking it of as, as a world of triangles, not a world of hexagons. Um, however, that's a, a problem for a different night. So. With that out the way, so you can see the, the journey that I've been on in the last week from writing editor to filtering CRT signals to thinking about hexes to finally coming up with something for the jam. Now, I've got a bit of a bind uh, because I don't want to give away sort of the, the crux of what my jam entry is. I want that to be a nice surprise for when the submission page goes up. Uh, so I'm going to sort of skirt around the edges of the things that I've been coding for the jam. And there'll probably be a couple more streams this week, actually, of me doing sort of uh, more content for this. Um, so what I thought would be quite interesting is fundamentally uh, a... It's not... It's, it's, I'm going to... Don't want to give too much away, but it's, it's, it's a platform game, but with a twist. Um, and I thought it'd be really good to actually see, you know, should I practice what I preach? How 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 can I use the pixel game engine stuff uh, and, and all of the utilities and the extensions to actually really get something done? And so it was. This, by this time, it was kind of Sunday morning. Um, so for the last, I'd say in the last two days, I've got about 20 hours of coding and I took some time off work uh, and uh, X10 is in the nursery. So I've been very lucky in this regard. 
Um, so uh, let's uh, let's go over to have a look at what we've got so far for this. Now, if you've been following along on the Discord, um, you'll have seen uh, some of these things already. So this is this is going to be my my jam entry. Did you all notice the very subtle loading screen that popped up? Uh, this is for me keeping the script and compile in mind. Um, so my entry is going to be called One Stupid Robot. Uh, and so far I've got a selection screen like this. Um, and we can go to credits and we can see some of the technologies that I, I'm using in there. And uh, we can go to have a look at what's going on. Now I'm just hijacking introduction to take me into sort of the level editor. And this was the irony I was talking about before. So I... I I'd, I'd like to have used my new editor to start doing these things, but I needed something quick and dirty off the cuff um, to start building. Now, everything that you see here, this genuinely has, has been really sort of the last the last couple of days really to put together. Um, so we've got an animated robot sprite that's using the Animate 2D utility, um, which is one of the Pixel Game Engine ones. Uh, we've got the camera following, uh, which is the camera 2D utility. Uh, and I'm using pretty much the collision detection code from the 2D platformer game. World of Triangles makes rendering easier for sure. Yeah, uh, it it does. I think. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I'm not going to get stuck into hexes again. That's the thing, right? Hexes intrigue me. I think that they are fascinating things. Um, but now. The camera moving around is uh, uses what's called a transformed view, which is, again is another pixel game engine thing, and it created this this whole world. There we go. So the whole you can see we've got this sort of boundary condition around the world here, so the player can't fall out. And so for my game, I know I need sort of a little bit of a platforming engine, uh, and so that's what I wanted to start working on. One of the nice things is I'm actually using reasonably high resolution graphics too, uh, so they they look they look quite nice. Hexes are not cool anymore. <laughs> Is this software rendered? Uh, yeah. Well, yes and no, right? So Pixel Game Engine fundamentally is 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 hardware rendered. Um, <laughs> is it software? Am I drawing things pixel by pixel? Not always. No. So it 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 makes it needs to make a decision between when that's an appropriate thing to do or not, and that's that's what the pixel game engine does behind the scenes. Uh, so one of the things I wanted was to to sort of quickly throw together worlds. So I made a design decision that the world should have this faint grid sort of splattered all over it, which I I thought was really quite nice actually. Um. Because you, you know, if you're laying out sort of platforms and things, you want to be able to make sure that the spaces and, and whatnot are there. Now, one of the things we can do is I can select a, a brush, and this brush allows me to place land. Now, as you can see, this is a big world. It's 64 by 64 tiles. Uh, that's what is that off the top of my head? That's 4,096. Somebody correct me if I've got that wrong. I might have got it wrong. I'm quite tired. Uh, 4096 tiles to place. Now, when people start creating worlds, I, I've noticed this is a trend in jams uh, and, and general sort of casual game dev. People go, right, I need, I need a, a world. I need a big world. I need, you know, a thousand by a thousand cells. And I sort of think, that's a million tiles. Are you going to sit there and hand draw a million tiles? What are you going to put in this world? And if you think back to sort of the games which are fundamentally tile-based and like childhood favorites things like mario and zelda and, but they're actually really dense low resolution tiled worlds uh, mainly because of memory restrictions but also that that sort of i i feel that, that enclosure uh, forces you into actually spending the time to make the world detailed and relevant and focus on the gameplay aspect so i have this sort of blank canvas of 64 by 64 tiles I've by, by no means am I going to use all of those for a given level, it's just, it's just how big my worlds are. Uh, now, I didn't want to have to sit placing all of the tiles manually. I don't have a sophisticated GUI. This is the Pixel Game Engine GUI extension. Uh, I don't have sort of tile selection tools and, and all that kind of thing. What I wanted was just I want to put a tile down and it appropriately choose the right tiles. So you can see.
which is quite nice, right? Now you'll see, I can still actually move the character around even though I'm not in following mode. So we can go back into to following mode. And the character behaves as you'd expect. So if I click on a cell, I basically place the tile. And if I click on it again, it, it erases the tile. <coughs> Is this PG3? No, this is straight up PG2. One nice little robot. I'm here for the hexagon stream. <laughs> we see that's it, my guess. So 16K by 16K is fantastic from a technical perspective, but from an actual creativity perspective, are you going to sit there and, and actually fill all of that space? That's a, that's a lot of tiles. <laughs> that's a, is that 256? million tiles yeah i think it is you're not going to want to do that why is twitch not notifying me when people i follow on i don't know i have to ask twitch uh, so but this is how far i've got and i've also got the ability to put in basically coins right <laughs> for all intents and purposes coins and when you collect them um they just fade out and i can reset them and recollect them so it's all quite nice and fluid uh, oh hang on go to Let's get rid of that coin. Let's go back to block brush. And that's how I wanted it to be. So it's, it's now, if, when, as I design the levels for this world, um, hopefully uh, it should be a lot more intuitive. Now, <coughs> excuse me. That's why I'm sort of saying about the uh, irony of uh, sort of auto tiling, because it, it, it is auto tiling, right? Uh, but it was auto tiling with a twist. There's a problem with my tile set. And that is, it has a big fat discontinuity in it. Um, it's not like tiling around a top-down dungeon where you've got a border around everything. Uh, instead, you've got this layer which is distinctly top and a layer which is distinctly bottom. Um, and this started to cause some headaches. So I'll take you on the journey I went through to try and solve this problem. And the disgusting solution that I've come up with for the time being, which, which will change before the, before the jam release. Uh, can you jump from the platform under it? No. Um, no, you can't. Uh, this is it's purely the cell is occupied. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a nice aesthetic, isn't it? And, and the good thing is, if we go back to free camera mode, uh, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, I just really like the, uh, the, the the graphics, by the way, obviously I've not drawn the graphics. Uh, they're from a, a Humble Bundle pack. Uh, if you don't use Humble Bundle, I recommend you should keep an eye out for some of the software packs that, that pop up from, from time to time. A lot of them contain very good assets that you can basically buy the license to use. Perfect for jams like this. I've not got time to do programmer art for something like this. Uh, so this is the, the editor that I've got so far. And of course, yes, you can sort of place stuff all over the place. Uh, and I've currently disabled a feature I showed on the Discord so where I could sort of draw like a pen and it would automatically uh, do the whole world. So there we go. So let's have a quick glance at some of the interesting bits of code that's that's in this. <coughs> uh, the let's let's start off with how am I doing the, the auto tiling? Because I think that's a, a fun a fun journey. Uh, where's the auto tiling? Auto tiling is in here. Right. So I thought I'll be dead clever, me, and uh, do my auto tiling uh, in this specific way. Let me just pull up the image that I was going to use. Right. So uh, I created this image. Uh, which is the each of these tiles is one to eight by one to eight pixels, uh, and in fact, what I should say is I actually only created what you can see on the screen. That ignore that ignore these two at the bottom. And I thought, right, what I need to do is basically come up with a, a mapping between the location of these tiles and the neighboring environments of solid tiles in my image. So you can imagine that my my world is basically an array of booleans, uh, and it can look at its neighbors and work out what's going on. A quick glance at some of the chat. Is this editor? It's all, all closed at the moment. 
yeah. At the moment, it, it, is, it is. It will. It will be. It will be all made public when it's uh, when it's mature enough to start accepting community contributions. And that that's actually a big part of the roadmap for my my editor. Um, the, the 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 fundamental premise is uh, actually a lot of the tooling is Lua scripts. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I, I wanted to come up with an interesting mapping, and I thought, right, I know logic. I'm an electronics guy. Let's uh, let's delve back into Karnoff maps and and back in the day. And so I did. I came up with sort of a set of mappings like this. Uh, and. I'm going to zoom in because I've commented them out because I, I thought I'll keep this because I put so much effort into to deriving them, um, but they didn't work. So I, I went to a different technique. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, sort of tri-state logic, it's not quite tri-state logic, but but we'll call it tri-state logic. Uh, you have ones, zeros, and don't cares. And and the don't cares are important, but they cause the problem. Uh, and so I created these maps, and, and so let's have a, have a look at what one of these maps means. Um, if I have got, uh, I don't care about what's around me in my top corners, but if I exist, which is this one in the middle, and my right neighbor exists, but my left neighbor doesn't exist, then, uh, pull the image, then I'm choosing that cell there, which makes sense, right? So that that's it doesn't matter what these sort of, neighboring corner cells are, or so I thought, um, un, but it does matter that I've got something solid next to me and something not solid on the other side of me. I must be that tile lurk. Right, so I went ahead and, and did that for every single one of the tiles in that sprite and created all these mappings. I thought, yeah, this is, this is great, it's really elegant. And then I reflected those mappings as a set of strings <coughs> excuse me, called patterns here, uh, in, I encoded them as a string. And what I would do is for every single cell in my map, I would work out what my, my neighbor's representation actually is by iterating around all the tiles around the particular one here, iterating and building up a map of the string. Here we go, so I, I, I append one if my neighbor exists in a particular location, I append zero if it doesn't. And then I compare that to uh, my string here and look in, take into account things like the don't cares and come up with a true or false result. Does it match? Did it not? So here you can see if the, if the pattern had a don't care, it, it always resolves as true. Uh, if it was a, a negative, then it's got to be false. If it's, a if it's a one, it's got to be true. I would reply, did we have a match or not? I thought, yeah, this is good. And do you know what? It worked. It worked very well. Um, it worked very well until I realized it was only really using about half the tiles. And it's because, because of the don't cares and the fact that the algorithm breaks early where, when it finds a match, I really wasn't getting a lot of the tiles in the bottom. So what it was ended up doing was building towers out of just layers of grass, which are logically valid solutions to what I'm trying to do, but they're not actually uh, sort of aesthetically correct solutions uh, given this sort of discontinuity in the data set here. <coughs> Standard in, hello. And so I thought, well, I'm in a jam, literally, I mean, I, you know, I'm in a, in a game jam and I'm also uh, in a jam now because I've spent quite a bit of time deriving all of this uh, and it's basically all wasted time. Uh, so what do I need? Well, the concept of looking at a cell and looking at your immediate eight neighbors to see whether they're true or false uh, to give you the actual cell you want uh, is, is quite useful. And if I pull up one note, so let's just dazzle everybody for a minute. Um, so if I, if I know I exist here as a cell, uh, then the first thing I'll do is check the here, 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 here and here. We can see I've got eight immediate neighbors. So I assume I always exist. Uh, well, if I've got eight immediate neighbors, how many logical permutations have I got around this cell? Well, the answer is 256. <coughs> I don't want one note in dark mode, Lando. Be quiet. Uh, can I get... So, so now I, I then realize, well, I've got 256 potential patterns around my, my active cell. Why 256? Well, here's one, and then quickly erase these. Then you've got two, 
And then you've not got three quite away because you're going around them in binary. You've got those two highlighted. So eventually you go all the way around counting uh, in basically ripple counting in binary. You end up with 256 patterns. This means in a mapping of patterns, if I have a table with 16 patterns across and 16 patterns down, and each one of these patterns consists of my sort of matrix like this, so 16 of those that way and 16 of those that way, uh, I can sort of fully define, fully spec every possible combination of cell. There will be duplicates, but nonetheless, I can be very precise about what I want. And because I'm particularly lazy and I like to do these things in a very visual way, it would be helpful if I sort of predefined cells like this visually and actually put in the right tile in the middle. <coughs> and bear in mind that my tiles are 128 by 128 pixels. So I've got 16 times 128 times 3 uh, which by my count is 6144. So I have a, a single image basically which is now 6144 pixels in both directions. You could all I know you're all sat rolling around the floor laughing with how ridiculous this is as a solution. And I will tidy it up because having the giga texture uh, is not particularly ideal for browsers. However, this is exactly what I did. I created the giga texture uh, in Affinity. Uh, so it was actually really therapeutic. Uh, it was quite a, quite a cathartic experience, sort of firstly creating the, uh, the cells in the background, which represent solid cells, <coughs> and then choosing the appropriate sprite uh, to put in the middle. And basically now in my render, I just, I just cut out that bit that I need. Yes, the obvious answer is look at this now and now create a mapping, and, and that will happen. But for the time being, Pixel Game Engine is more than happy to just load up the Mega Sprite and uh, sample from it to the correct location. Like Magetsu, give it a rest, right? It's it's it's. <laughs> thank thank you, Technic Gel. Exactly, right? You get it. It was a, it was a good <laughs> a good two hours this <laughs> putting this together <laughs> on the chat. Uh, so yeah, exactly. Make it mega text. That's what you always do, right? So if 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 you ever need things to be really quick and just get the job done, just use more and more memory. So as you can see, we start up in the top corner. We've got basically nothing. We've got no neighbors. So I'm I'm a single, just out there little island floating in space. And here, uh, I've you know this is the equivalent of my don't curse. I'm still a single item floating in space because I don't really care about the diagonals. However, these ones, they look a bit ominous when they're isolated on their own like this. Um, they can only exist in that scenario. So this is quite a nice way of, of working out where things can only exist. And it covers every single permutation. And as we get down to the bottom right, we end up in the situation where if every single one of my neighbours, then I've just got to be dirt filled in. Well, you see, I thought there'd be more patterns in this than the than I was originally expecting. Um, it turns out, yes, there are patterns. So you know, the the don't care approach would would have worked fine, but there are some rather obscure little subtle one-offs uh, which don't tend to fall into um, some degree of symmetry. Let's try to find one now. Yeah, like this one, for example. Right, so this had to be, I had to create some special artwork to cover a few legitimate corner cases in this instance. So you can see everything kind of looks very familiar in, in the neighborhood. It's all, all similar stuff. Um, but then you've just got this one uh, in isolation there, which isn't used anywhere. So that's the only place that one's defined. But you'll be surprised how often that one comes up. I enjoyed doing it this way, and also it was, it was helpful to, to debug it, so now at least I know that my patterns are correct, uh, because I could actually put an identifying blob on some of them, so, you know, even though this one, all they all look like the same ones being chosen, um, it, was, it was useful to identify why it was being chosen, actually, in real time when I was drawing them on the screen. So you can see there are subtle differences. Uh, if we look at this one, if... If this top, it turns out the diagonals were more important than you think. So if this top right one was empty, 
then this has to be a platform of some description. It can't be anything else. So then you know that it's got to then have a platform in the middle. And it, it just I just enjoyed sort of working out all the logic of it. Uh, so yes, the mega texture. It actually compresses really, really well. <laughs> it's only like 800k uh, uh, PNG. Uh, but of course, I've got to inflate it for Pixel Game Engine. It ends up being something like a 600 megabyte uh, texture. So <laughs> I'll sort that out before we, uh, before we do it. <laughs> Sorry, Magetsam. Yeah, it's not smart, uh, but it got the job done. You know, I'm time sensitive in the jam. Um, <laughs> so yes, the the the, the mega texture uh, was was my solution. So let's have a look. What else was there that was that was interesting in the code? So uh, I I did actually discuss also a little bit on this. I've decided to just have a great big global variable. Um, so it's actually a, a, a class called game assets, and, and this is a pattern I quite like. Uh, it's useful when you're sort of jamming a game out to be able to sort of access things as you need it, but I wanted to do it in a sensible way. And I, I thought, I know that I'm going to have sort of a title screen, and I'm going to have credit screens, and I'm going to have loading screens, and I'm going to have gameplay screens, and all this. And I thought, well, Typically, what's everybody's go-to data structure for handling game modes? And they go, stack. Right? Without a second thought, stack. Right? And actually, I really don't like stacks as sort of a game mode state machine. Um, the reason being is, even from a UI perspective, it's always nice that you can always have like a, a back key and you know where you're going. That, that's fine, and, and it does have its place. Uh, but I actually sometimes think, you just really want to jump from one state to another. You don't want to have to go through several hierarchical, hierarchical layers in order to get there. Um, and so there's nothing wrong with that. That's just a, a normal finite state machine without the uh, necessary addition of a stack added to it. But anyway, some sort of map you could make in code from that. <laughs> You've given up on the jam, been making Minecraft <laughs> Minecraft mods. Oh dear. So what I ended up doing for, for sort of my handling my state transitions, I thought ended up being pretty neat. And if I look at the uh, the main uh, main function, so this is the now sort of the, the core program. In fact, this is this is the main pixel game engine implementation. So familiar functions. On user create, uh, all I'm creating is a, an unordered map uh, given these game assets, uh, which is an enum class, and I create a state for that. Uh, I then can go and call the onCreate function for all those states. I've, I've isolated that because I thought I might need to. Probably don't, to be honest. Uh, but one of the nice ways of doing it this way is actually the, the core infrastructure of the program now becomes very simple. In fact, that's it. That's my onUser update function for the, the whole game. The states themselves uh, when you call the onUpdate function on the state, return what it expects the next state to be. And, and that's the kind of level of encapsulation I'm, I'm quite happy with. So for the most part, a state, let's say it's the gameplay state, will just simply return stay in gameplay until the player exits or loads up a menu or something else. Uh, in which case, this little loop can then be signaled to, to move on to the appropriate state. And by capturing on exit and on enters, uh, you can do appropriate cleanup and and initialization is necessary but you can also potentially pass information uh, from state to state as well <clears throat> effectively my game assets big global variable is that is currently responsible for the uh, passing of information between states and so i created a base class called game mode um, here which takes in a pointer to the game assets because you can tell i'm in jam mode because we're not really using smart pointers and things all over the place it's just it just I'm just trying to hack out code as quickly as possible. And so this, again, it's all been really sort of the, the last couple of days or so. Foxel, good evening. And so uh, all of my game states obviously inherit from this, so that way they've all got these, uh, these virtual functions implemented. Now let's have a look at a really simple one. So this is the one that displays the credits. Uh, you can see that the actual header file has literally nothing of interest in it. It's just, just going to implement those. Uh, but if we go and look at the body for it, it's very simple. Uh, the onUpdate function for the credit screen. I just want to draw a picture. I'm, I'm cheaping out. 
I've created a fixed image which represents all of the credit information that I want displayed. I'm just going to draw it on the screen. Um, <coughs> my assets use the actual file path as the key uh, to, the, to that particular asset. I've made a conscious decision that that's a design decision I'm okay with um, because I don't have that many graphics assets here and none of my game is sort of running in a time critical loop as such. Uh, I don't mind that there's a bit of an overhead trying to work that out to, to pull out the correct graphic and it's doing that for all of the main graphics but there's, there's actually not as many as you think. Uh, and, and the ones that do need to be accessed quickly aren't accessed this way. I'll show that in a minute. Uh, but what I wanted to show here is the on update function that all I'm responsible for in this particular state is the spacebar being pressed. So I draw that screen until the user presses the spacebar. And when they do, I return to the main menu. If the spacebar isn't pressed, I want to stay in the credit state. And I've actually found this a really flexible way of, of just quickly gluing together different parts of game. <coughs> uh, so let's have a look at the... Now, an, interest, an interesting one is the loading state. I know that I'm going to be compiling this with uh, the Imscriptum tool set in order to get it to run in the browser. Uh, and you, you do kind of want a bit of a loading screen for that, or else you could have a, just a pause there whilst you're waiting for things to happen. And so I wanted to load up my assets. Now, I've seen this come up on the Discord quite a bit. People just tend to load all of their assets in one big hit right at the start of the program. Or people do very complicated deferred loading schemes. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, my approach is to just basically load one asset per frame. There's all sorts going on here. What's going on? Kodo Simeo. Hello. You can load assets with inscription from C++ file. Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, so basically it creates a, a virtual file system, um, which it, it's all hidden there as one big blob of data on the web server, which only that particular in, uh, web compiled thing can access. Uh, so let's have a look at my loading state. Right, so this is, this is what happens on loading. So on the onCreate function, I'm basically filling a vector full of strings, which are all the assets that I want. Um, Including including the uh, the mega tile the mega asset. <coughs> uh, and what I do now in my on update, which is called once per frame, I'm just scrolling through these one at a time, updating a uh, updating a progress bar, which we can see here. There we are. So that's me creating a progress bar and displaying which asset is being loaded. Just some sort of visual recognition of what's happening. Uh, when the last asset is loaded, I then need to go and use the Animate 2D facility to go and create all of the animation states for the, the little robot guy. Uh, he has quite a few different animation states. He can blink, he can run, he can jump, he can fall, and he can die as well. And uh, I'll let you into a little Easter egg um, at, well, just before we, we finish. And I'm not going to delve into how the Animate 2D thing works, but that's it. So once you've loaded up all the appropriate graphics for the little robot, now I can just call upon particular state, a given time, and I'll get the right frame that I need. Uh, let's see how that comes together. But what I'm going to do is artificially delay uh, the loading so we can see it load. So here's the loading screen. Oh, yeah, it's loading everything up. Before we get going, you can see the memory. Oh, there's the <laughs> big spike there. That was the giga texture. And we've got one stupid robot as the start screen. So when it finished loading, it then changed the state into the main menu. And on the state, if you press the number key, this is this is a little Easter egg. If you press the particular number key here, so if I press one, fine, he sits there. If I press two, he's now playing his blinking animation. If I press three, there's his death animation. Four is his launch animation. Five is his I'm in the air animation. Six is I'm in the air but I'm falling. And seven is running. I think that's it. Yeah. Just those seven different states. But what lessons have I learned whilst creating this so far in the last couple of days is for jams, use tools. Do not start everything from scratch. If I'd had to code the uh, the camera code, the animation code, the asset manager code, 
the data file stuff for the background code, the camera handling code, all from scratch, I'd be nowhere. Um, so it's been great to just sort of jump in straight away and within you know 10 lines of code, have a guy walking around on the screen. <coughs> And uh, well, that's it. That's our hour. We've used our hour. That's gone quick, hasn't it? Um, I will be doing some more streams this week. Uh, probably, I'll probably try and do them on Twitch. Um, I'm just conscious. I don't want to sort of give away what the secret source is behind what this this game's really about. Um, not not yet. I, I like like people to have the surprise. So I'll I'll be streaming some of the uh, level creation and content creation phases. I think over the next couple of days. Uh, if you want to see the progress of people's jam entries, get on the Discord. There's a special chat for it. I've not really checked the itch page today. I, I, I know we had a couple of spam entries put in, but I've tried to nuke those each time they've popped up. Um, until then, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time. Thank you all. Goodbye. <laughs>